the fascist main supply hub on Kerbin, has just been dealt with. And now, the Central Kerbin Alliance Network has the opportunity to strike their staging area on the Mun, taking control of the portal through which they've been sending equipment. Success on the Mun will be the beginning of the end for the fascists. I am Echo 3, and let's continue discussing the Cold War. As the Communist bloc and the Central Kerbin Alliance Network had nearly exhausted themselves in their struggle for dominance over Kerbin, that is when the fascists used the opportunity to make their move. And although the fascists had developed some very technologically advanced equipment, resistance from the Central Kerbin Alliance Network and the Communist PAC has so far proven much more than the fascists were anticipating. And now, Secan has just landed tanks on the Mun, with the goal being to destroy all of the enemy equipment at the staging area, and ultimately to take complete control of this side of the portal. An enemy heavy tank has been spotted. The enemy tanks are massive, and yet they still rely primarily on technology from the last war. They do not have the advanced sights or armor composites that the Central Criminal Alliance Network does. But a direct hit from that massive cannon would still be devastating. It looks like Secan's XM-1 tank has managed to put the fascist tank out of commission. Its depleted uranium Sabo rounds are able to make quick work of enemy armor. But there's more than just a tank here too. There's some other equipment that will need to be neutralized. As the Secan tank moves in, it maintains a watchful eye on the enemy tank and puts a few more rounds through it, just for good measure. It looks like there's a fighter and one of those odd fascist saucer things as well. So the tank moves in to take those out as well. It sets its sights on the saucer and blows it up. All that's left now is to take out the fighter. It looks like debris from the saucer has already damaged it. But the tank will close in and destroy it nonetheless. The tank continues to advance it lines up on the fighter and destroys it as well. And with that, the Central Criminal Alliance Network has taken control of the Mun side of the portal. But there's still the other side to deal with. It's time, once again, for the Central Criminal Alliance Network to revisit one of their old projects. The supersonic low-altitude missile is just a thing to destroy the enemy's main base that is believed to be on Lathe. This Julian Moon has a thick, oxygen-rich atmosphere similar to Kerbin's. It looks like the fascists were able to use some of their very advanced technology to move their industry off-world and prepare for the next war. Only by destroying their main base can the Central Criminal Alliance Network hope to end this conflict. Besides the missile, the rocket will include a powerful relay section that will remain in orbit around Lathe. Combined with the Voyager probe that is still in orbit around Jewel, Secan should be able to maintain a comnet connection with the missile. With the relay section complete, engineers are now constructing a deorbit stage because the nuclear stage on the missile only works in an atmosphere. The deorbit stage will be used to lower the missile's orbit and help pinpoint exactly where it will enter Lathe's atmosphere. Although, if needed, the engine on the missile could fly around Lathe almost indefinitely. Also being utilized from Project ELU are the nerve engines. These type of atomic engines have a very high specific impulse and are ideal for moving large payloads around the solar system. Now the craft has plenty of Delta V to go from low curve in orbit to Lathe, but it still has to reach orbit. And for that, engineers are assembling a very large first stage booster. But even with five mainsail engines, the thrust to weight ratio will still be just a little low. So with that, engineers have decided to go with the mantra of more boosters. A couple of Clydesdale solid rocket boosters should be more than sufficient. Originally, these solid rocket boosters were designed for Secan's shuttle program, but they're also helpful for increasing the thrust to weight ratio on the first stage of a Joule 5 rocket. Four fins are added to increase the rocket's stability in the lower atmosphere. Now all that's left is to take the rocket to the launch site and send it to Joule. After the fascist bomb, the main space center, all launches have needed to take place from the island. The restoration of the KSC facilities has been a top priority. And with the enemy finally being pushed back on all fronts, 
The time and funds have now become available. Stage separation of the solid rocket boosters has gone well, and the core stage has plenty of delta V to get the rocket the rest of the way into orbit. There is actually enough delta V in the core stage to help kick the rocket on its way towards Joule. But now, for the rest of the journey to Lathe, the nerve engines will be used. The first step is to get an encounter with the gas giant, Joule. Joule has a very large sphere of influence, so getting an encounter with it is not too difficult. But inside of Joule's gravity well, maneuvers can be very costly. There are five moons in the Julian system. Lathe is the innermost moon. But the third moon, Tylo, has the strongest gravity. If one then can adjust their Joule encounter such that their craft flies by Tylo, they can then get their craft into orbit around Joule without any extra delta V. By using a gravity assist off of Tylo, the missile will then have extra delta V for its maneuvering to get into orbit around Lathe. The Voyager probe has remained in orbit around Joule for quite some time and has detected what is believed to be the fascist main base near the equator on Lathe. At its Julian apoapsis, the missile adjusts its orbit so that it will now fly by Lathe. The lower stage of the missile will remain in orbit around Lathe and act as a relay, so it will need to remain in a high enough orbit to have good signal coverage. Thanks to a very good gravity assist off of Tylo, the craft has plenty of delta V left for maneuvers around Lathe. The inclined orbit around Lathe will make it a lot easier to pick exactly where the missile should enter Lathe's atmosphere. The maneuver is now set for it to get into orbit around Lathe, but it will lose signal briefly as it comes around on the back side of the moon. But as its orbit takes it further south, it will regain signal back with Kerbin. Controllers back on Kerbin are getting very excited. Potentially, this is it. This mission could stop the fascists once and for all. The deorbit section has decoupled from the relay section and is preparing to enter Lace atmosphere. This is a very critical stage. Lathe has a thick atmosphere, and entry can be very difficult. While the atmosphere is not as unforgiving as Eve's, it can still be tricky. Lathe's atmosphere extends up to 50 kilometers above sea level. And while that is 20 kilometers shorter than Kerbin's, near sea level, it is about as dense. Combined with the fact that Lathe has less gravity than Kerbin, one should expect that an aircraft would fly very similar on the two worlds. The missile plunges into laced atmosphere, with the fairing taking the brunt of the entry heating. There are a few parts on the missile that might not be able to handle this level of heat, so only once the craft has slowed down a little bit will the fairing be jettisoned. Once the fairing is jettisoned, the engine on the rocket must quickly be started. Otherwise, the missile will tumble into the sea and the mission will be lost. As quickly as possible, the missile orients itself and begins heading towards the target. Due to the nature of how the atomic thermal jet engine works, this craft would be able to fly even if Lathe didn't have oxygen in its atmosphere. Now that the missile is in the lower atmosphere, it is able to quickly accelerate. Just over those hills in the distance is the fascist base. By destroying their manufacturing headquarters, this should finish them off once and for all. The missile is flying very low. It's doubtful that the fascists have even detected it. There, on that flat area, dead ahead is the base. The missile is locked on and flies directly towards the target. The enemy certainly wasn't expecting this. The warhead is armed and the missile dives right in towards the target. And the warhead detonates. And with that, it's over. The enemy has been wiped out, both on Lathe and Kerbin. And Seacan has been very busy back on Kerbin. The Space Center has been given a complete overhaul. New runways, new launch pads, new assembly building, new science building, the whole thing. It's been remodeled and redone and improved. And it's not just the fascists that have been defeated. Communist governments all over the globe are falling. The wall in Kerblin has been torn down, with its east and west being reunified. And what's even more remarkable is the union of Kerbal Socialist Republics has fallen. It has broken apart into smaller republics, with many of them, for the first time ever,
democratically electing their leaders. But communism hasn't fallen everywhere. Several communist governments have managed to retain power. But for all intents and purposes, one could justifiably say that the Cold War is over. Perhaps Kerbin is now in store for a new era of peaceful exploration, where Kerbal kind can work together to explore the wonders of the Kerbal system. And maybe, just maybe, Kerbal kind will go beyond the Kerbal system and begin exploring the stars. I am Echo 3, and thanks for joining me to discuss the Cold War. I will see you next time.